When it comes to inflating the GDP, there are many paths in the game of Victoria 3 to take. Russia is a nation with huge resources and opportunity to go down just about any path, but let's be honest here. The best path is almost always to conquer more territory from your enemies rather than to exploit your own resources. This is because when we exploit our own resources, we benefit in some way, but by robbing our rivals of their territory, we benefit and they lose at the same time. That means that it's time for Russia to rise to the top of the food chain. I'm going for about 5 billion GDP this run, not because it's the highest and most impressive GDP out there, but just because it gives me some arbitrary goal to reach for. Here's the thing I've come to realize with Victoria 3 guides, having made a lot of them now. They're all the same after the first 10 years. What I mean is that although any given nation may have different opening moves, once you're a great power with a modern army, the follow-up plays are just to conquer a bunch of land and to spam out industries and construction sectors until you hit your desired end goal. With that in mind, I've covered building up a big economy many times, so we're going to mostly let that go to the wayside, and instead focus on the conquests and some of the interesting occurrences. I will say, a new patch is coming for Victoria 3 soon, so we're going to probably lay off on the guide content for Vic 3 until that patch comes out, since it might spice up the strategies a little bit. That means this video might end up being shorter than usual. I'm not sure since I'm writing this before I've completed the script, so maybe enough stuff will happen that this video is still long. Let's go find out. My previous efforts to become a republic have mostly been assuaged, as I've gone on to focus on other political issues, namely tax reform and freedom of speech. The taxes are important because in order to grow the economy, I need income. Currently, my businesses are making pretty good profits, so switching to graduated tax will help my income a lot. The income taxes for graduated taxation aren't as good as proportional taxation, but I'd rather see my standard of living climb than make a slightly higher income. Passing those laws went without any problem, although graduate taxation took some time due to only the trade unions really supporting it. I then passed protected speech because most of my interest groups are radicals, so all those interest groups will approve the law change. Anyway, the final change to make was to become a republic. Most of my conservative interest groups were acting to restore rights of assembly, and that was actually what allowed me to become a republic. Although the conservative interest groups were still radicalized by the change, their willingness to rebel in the name of rights of assembly as opposed to in the name of the monarchy is much lower. Luckily for me, those interest groups are stuck in that political movement and can't escape until that movement dissipates. This means I can pass the change to republic without any revolution, giving me this brand new Russian republic flag. Let's discuss the actual reason to want to be a republic, since sometimes it's not always obvious. Effectively, a republic allows you to be more flexible with your government. A parliamentary republic can have a larger government without penalty, and since the largest interest group in government becomes the new president or chancellor, you can sort of choose your leader. As well, the additional legitimacy from votes lets you maintain high legitimacy with interest groups that aren't necessarily just the monarchs or the mostly undesirable conservative establishment. I can more effectively control the makeup of my nation when I'm a republic because the interest groups will better represent the actual people whose groups I can manipulate via my choice in ownership methods and choice of buildings. If I want to maintain a conservative slant, I need more aristocrats, and if I want a stronger army interest group, I need a larger standing army. Generally speaking though, if you want to maintain a strong conservative establishment, the best way to do so is to just change voting laws to landed or wealth voting, honestly. So that's the point of republics. Flexibility. In my honest opinion, I usually don't find republics worth changing over to. The authority from a monarchy usually far outweighs the bonuses of a republic, particularly if the interest group of the monarch is a good one. For example, Britain has Queen Victoria, an industrialist. That's an extremely desirable interest group, so why become a republic? In my case, my old king, Alexander Romanov, was actually an intelligentsia member, meaning I'd have been fine staying a monarchy. I changed to Republic just because of the roleplay, more than anything. Speaking of taxes from before, by the way, we're going to implement worker protections now, which is normally a bit counterintuitive to graduated tax systems, because my taxes mostly come from dividends. Choosing to increase minimum wages will affect my taxes heavily. The reason I'm doing this is something of a long-term investment. If my pops make more money, they consume more goods, and that means I will see higher demand for goods from my industries. Higher demands means more profits, which will produce more taxes at the end of the day, while also raising my pops' wealth. Beyond that, the reforms are still ongoing. The next thing up is protectionism, because I intend to keep all my resources for myself. The reason I have to go protectionist is because I don't really do much trade. In general, I can just produce everything I need locally, so that's what I'll do. If any AI makes a trade route with me to steal my stuff, I'll set it to protect domestic supply tariffs and make good money on it. You'll immediately also notice my budget improving thanks to this. You'll immediately notice my budget improving thanks to this. Also, the reason why my budget has been so negative is that I switched over to steel building methods, which I've slowly been rebalancing my economy around. The next reform was women's suffrage. The time where women's suffrage is the correct choice is when you need a larger workforce and you have enough immigration that you can exchange the birth rate you once had in return for immigrants. Anyway, that's enough reform for now. Let's look more at the whole country again. Throughout most of this run, I've been basically isolationist outside of the Central Asian conquest from the beginning. I recently got trench infantry, and now that I'm done reforming the country, it's time to really go at it. 
I'm going to start researching malaria prevention, and since I built up all those universities in the last part, I research things super fast. While that's researching, I'm going to grab South Africa, which broke free from Britain at some point. I didn't catch how they did it. This will be back down when I mobilized my entire army. Next up, I went for the Boer states. I grabbed Zulu after a short war, then Transvaal back down, and Oranje did the same. In this time, I finished researching malaria prevention and just planted colonies everywhere. I've been rebalancing the budget as well through briefly increasing taxes, building up my steel and explosives to cheapen the construction goods, and then lowering taxes back down. So far, so good for the economy. I've grown to 1.3 billion in a relatively short time. As I build new stuff in lower populated states, I've been having immigration to those places, and now I've got an enclave of North Italians at the Don River Delta, and a bunch of Han Chinese people near the Caspian in Uralsk. By 1891, I've got 1.5 billion GDP and a healthy surplus budget while constructing, with the GDP still climbing. My next conquest was against the Ottomans, since I know the oil is going to be relevant soon, so it's time to get Iraq. The Ottomans back down and had me Basra, which is going to be a running theme this run. The AI will often back down against a nation as powerful as mine, so that means big conquests all at once can feel impossible. I was thinking of grabbing the British Raj, but then I saw a huge opportunity. Britain is a major power. I'm not sure how it happened, but basically this is going to be the easiest puppet grab I've ever seen. It's going to cost a hard of infamy, but that's fine. I'm ready to never go back. Indeed, they backed down relatively quickly, and now all of India is mine, alongside the British themselves, who did sadly lose most of their colonies, but were still quite the asset to have. I would comment on the GDP growth, but genuinely, it's just me sitting here building whatever is expensive until it's not expensive anymore. This is sort of what I mean about all of these guides being the same, by the way. The only sort of experimental move I made was to change all my farms to the highest level production method, and then subsidize them, putting my budget into the negative 3 million level. The idea here is to skyrocket the standard of living by making grain literally worthless, but without crashing the agriculture economy. Think of it like a stimulus. I'm going to remove these subsidies later, but while grain is super cheap, my pops will buy a bunch and inflate their standard of living. Once I remove the subsidies, the price will rebalance and the standard of living will resume normal growth, or it might even deflate. But regardless, it should end up higher than it would have been had I not done this. We'll see. It's an experiment, so I'm not sure if it'll work. Heading into 1894, September, my standard of living is 21.1 with 2 billion GDP. I made the switch in 1893, December, at 20 standard of living and 1.8 billion GDP. I'm going back to third level of farming, which will rebalance the price, and let's see how it affects the GDP and standard of living. By March of 1896, my GDP is 2.2 billion, and standard of living is plateaued around 21.0. In a way, the standard of living deflated, but as I expected, it ended up rising higher than it ended up deflating, and the GDP kept up. That's most likely thanks to my economy continuing to grow, but I think the point of it inflating the standard of living and then slightly deflating at worse means you can sort of inject money into your people through subsidies temporarily. Anyway, all those comparative calculations will be ruined now because I am annexing the British Raj. Obviously, when several hundred million people join the country, the standard of living will massively tank. From here, what more do I say? I made an interesting discovery with regards to effectively government stimulus packages, and now I'm just going to get my GDP inflated through making and annexing puppets. I'll still be building up the economy in the motherland, but we can also just use the pre-built economies of our enemies to supplement our own. Oh hey, check it out! Do any of you guys remember the Great Russian Migrations into Persia of 1897? American Capitalist Revolt, need I say more? A quick uprising in Delhi, nothing to see here. I'm also turning Canada into an honest-to-god Russian colony, except Quebec. No one wants to go to Quebec. In 1902, I annexed Britain, which gave me a pretty solid boost GDP, and I'm up to 3.4 billion. Like I said before, I'd commented buildings, but I mean, what's there to say? Next puppet was France, who became a major power after recent revolution. Like everyone in the world, they back down, of course. Spain next. Check out the state of Australia here in 1903, by the way. What causes this? The weird, intertwined South Australia and New South Wales thing. I don't actually know why this happens relatively often. At this point, I'm almost on annexing all the princely states, which means I'll have all of India under my empire. I don't honestly even need all these pops, but each pop at the very least work as a peasant and create something for the GDP. Looking around the map a bit, we can see some expat Americans have gone off to live on the Amazon, and even in Guyana, Russians have settled down. Somehow, despite all the russification efforts of the Russian Republic, the Kalmyk people have still held out in Ostrakhan. Will they be russified? Who knows? We do eventually hit the point where any Russian campaign will get to, which involves a certain seizure of a certain means of a certain verb. At the 1906, at 4.4 billion GDP, I began the change to Council Republic, mostly because I'm playing Russia, so why not, right? I already know that Russia will become the Soviet Union, so it sounds good to me. In 1907, the means of production could be considered seized as far as the Russian people were concerned, and we were all. And we also were at 4.7 billion. 
That's not too bad, but let's keep it going and hopefully hit 5 billion and then, and then finish this campaign. Becoming a council republic mostly ruined my government budget given that now I get no investment pool. I Meaning I once again have to restructure my economy, but honestly, I don't care to. I'm basically going to let the government debt climb Mount Everest and just keep adding height to the mountain to try and outpace the climb until I'm done my goal for this run. In 1908, at 4.9 billion GDP, I'm going to annex France and hopefully jump over to 5 billion. Let's see. France back down, and I did in fact jump to 5 billion. Nice. I wasn't quite done there though, and I decided to go after Prussia too, since they're like pretender Russia and I might as well puppet them. Think of this like a relentless push west or something. Prussia back down, Scandinavia back down, and I was done now. I let the game run a little bit longer, and then started looking around the map for interesting occurrences to document. First of all, I've almost completed the Russification of Poland, and Persia is now almost completely Russian. I'm particularly proud of having Azerbaijan's Russification completed, since it's a pretty high population state. Africa is divided along Russian and Bengali lines, of all things. I guess Bengalis are a huge population within my nation, so it makes sense for them to be emigrating about. Unfortunately, the Canadians have reclaimed their homes, presumably by assimilating my pops into theirs, although we've still got the Oregon Territory as rightfully Russian. Looks like those Yankees in the Amazon were actually all New Yorkers, although they'd have to be South Italian for that to apply perfectly. It's fine. Point is that Brazil is the new Little Italy of the Americas. Well, that's about all the interesting stuff I could find. So that's Russia. They're fun, they're powerful, and they're probably the best nation to play if you want a laid-back but powerful run. France has to do conquests to reach its zenith, and Qing is a tough opening. Russia is the best of both worlds. Either way, in terms of Victoria 3 content coming up, I'm going to halt the guides for now until the new patch. Most of you know that 1.2 is coming, and it will likely change the balance of things a bit. It'll be unwise to make a guide which could be outdated in as little as a few weeks, so I'm going to maybe go do some other Victoria content and focus back in on CK3 for a bit too. I know lots of you are here for Victoria 3 content, and rest assured, it's still here, but I would highly recommend the CK3 content because I really put a lot of work and pride into those videos. That's all from me for now. Thank you for your time.